Uh, it is a real privilege today for me to welcome uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg. I've had a chance to see him from a distance uh, for quite a few years. As I said, I wasn't kidding. I am the resident Norwegian, uh, and uh, I do have a very fond uh, attachment to my old home country. Uh, and in that capacity, watched the Secretary General when he did a marvelous job in, uh, as, as Prime Minister in Norway. Uh, I would say, he's the first Prime Minister I know of that started off as a statistician in the government, you know, which <laughs> tells you his attention to detail is impeccable, but his policy interest and scope is vast. And I think it's a combination of skills we most need now in NATO. We're facing some very, very big challenges for NATO in a way, and uh, I think all of us had hoped that the Cold War had ended and it had changed the trajectory of history. We're now back into a scratchy relationship and we're grateful that someone of his talent and caliber is leading the way for all of us during these rather trying times. In our conversation, I, uh, we were just talking about all of the challenges that America faces today and we've got a lot of them around the world. But no place do we have the foundation of strength that we have in NATO. And it's on that foundation that we're going to build a successful strategy going forward. So I would ask you with your applause to please welcome the Secretary General of NATO, His Excellency Herr Stoltenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Hamre, dear John, uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be here and to address this uh, distinguished uh, audience and to be in this uh, beautiful uh, building. And uh, uh, you told me, John, uh, when we were sitting in uh, the room behind there that uh, your family is from Norway, and that's great. Uh, but you told me more than that. You told me that your family is from uh, Voss and Granwin. And Voss and Granwin, that's uh, as perhaps the two most beautiful places in Norway at the West Coast, at least Granwin. Uh, the only problem is that when I was Prime Minister, I was responsible for building a power line uh, to Granwin. Uh, <laughs> and that was one of the big, big you know, say, conflicts I had uh, during my time. As, uh, so I've never been back in Granwin since I, <laughs> since I built uh, the power line. But uh, if you go to, together with me, I will dare go back to Granwin. Um, and I also know that you are very proud of your uh, Viking roots, and there are many reasons to be proud of that. Um, and uh, in addition to that, you have uh, received uh, the uh, Royal Norwegian Order of Merit, and that is the highest honor my country can bestow on uh, foreign citizens. And uh, uh, combined with the fact that you, for many, many years, have um, worked so hard to develop uh, the bonds and the cooperation between North America and Europe, the transatlantic bonds which are so uh, vital for our uh, security. I think the, the fact that you have these uh, Viking roots and that you have the Royal Norwegian Order of Merit and your engagement here at the uh, CSIS, all of that makes you a perfect host uh, to a uh, Norwegian NATO Secretary General to speak about our changed security environment. And what we as uh, a transatlantic community need to do about uh, it, about the uh, changing uh, security environment we are uh, facing. So uh, we are at the turning point uh, for Euro-Atlantic security. We face raising challenges the very fabric of our security order is at stake, and we must be prepared for the long haul. And that is why we need to adapt. To the south, the challenges are complex and diverse. The Arab Spring has turned to brutal winter. Failed and weak states uh, are fueling regional instability and sectarian strife. ISIL and other extremist groups spread terror and intolerance and uh, inspired attacks from Paris to Texas. And people, and people move in large numbers, many to flee and uh, others to fight. 
NATO is playing its part uh, in addressing these challenges in the Middle East and in uh, North Africa. And I am ready to um, set out what we are doing in greater detail during our discussion. But let me, in my opening remarks, uh, not address the challenges we see to the south, but focus on the challenges we are facing coming from the east. And then I promise to answer questions related to the south afterwards. The challenges we see uh, coming from the south uh, are clear, and they are coming from a resurgent Russia. Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea and its continued destabilization of Ukraine have brought armed conflict back to Europe. This conflict has already cost over 6,000 lives. There are continuous ceasefire violations and heavy fighting could flare up at uh, any moment. That is why I fully support the efforts of the United States, as well as Germany and France, to find a political solution to the crisis in Ukraine. The path to peace is the full implementation of the Minsk agreements. So I urge all parties to take that path. Russia has a special responsibility. It supports the separatists in eastern Ukraine with training, weapons, and forces. And it maintains a large number of troops on Ukraine's border. But we cannot look at uh, Russia's aggressive actions in Ukraine in isolation. They are part of a disturbing pattern of Russian behavior that goes well beyond Ukraine. And this pattern undermines key principles of European security. Respect for borders, the independence of states, transparency and predictability of military activities, and a commitment to resolve differences to diplomacy, not force. First, let's look at respect for borders. The UN Charter and the Helsinki Final Act are clear. Russia actually helped to draft these documents and sign them, but it has broken its commitments. Crimea has been part of Ukraine since the country became independent, but Russia sent in troops without insignia, organized the so-called referendum which met no international standard and seized part of another country. President Putin even admitted publicly that Crimea's annexation had been planned in advance. After the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, Russia recognized two Georgian regions as independent states. It has taken almost full control over both, and built fences between them and the rest of Georgia. It has also sent troops into Moldova that Moldova wants out, and, and which Russia pledged to withdraw in 1999. So Russia has been violating the territorial integrity of its neighbors for years, and continue to do so. That brings me to my second principle the independence of states. Ukraine's desire to move closer to the European Union was met by force. So was Georgia's aspirations, aspiration to join NATO. Moldova has also received clear warnings about closer moves toward Europe. Russia's leaders claim that its neighborhood rep represents a zone of privileged interests. But its efforts to create a sphere of influence risk taking us back in time to when greater powers, when great powers drew lines on the map at the expense of smaller states. And nations 
were not free to decide their own destiny. This could create a sphere of instability for us all. And it's not the sort of Europe we want, we will accept 25 years after the end of the Cold War. The third principle is transparency and predictability in military activities. For decades, we, build, we built a stable European security system based on fewer forces, fewer weapons, and fewer large exercises, on more information sharing, and on arms control agreements to build trust and confidence across former dividing lines. These agreements reduce the risk of conflict and miscalculation. The, con the Conventional Forces uh, in Europe Treaty put limits on number of movement and movement of equipment like tanks and fighter planes. But Russia unilaterally suspended implementation. The Open Skies Treaty allows us to look at each other's territory from the air to increase transparency. But Russia is obstructing these activities. The Vienna document sets out rules for reporting large military exercises and allows for inspection. But Russia has found ways around it to avoid notifying the largest military exercises in the post-Cold War era. Three of these SNAP exercises have included over 80,000 troops, moving over great distances and at great speed. One such SNAP exercise in February of last year was used to deploy forces to annex Crimea. Others masked support to separatists in eastern Ukraine and led to the buildup of forces on Ukraine's border. As I speak, Russia is conducting yet another SNAP exercise with 250 aircraft and 700 pieces of heavy equipment. NATO, on the other hand, strives to create transparency and predictability. Our largest exercise in 20 years will take place next fall in Italy, Portugal, and Spain. It was announced one year ago. It was not a SNAP exercise. International observers, including Russia, will have access to our exercise. And you can find the schedule of our planned exercises on NATO's website. Because we have nothing to hide. Whereas Russia is doing all it can to minimize the transparency of what its forces are doing. And this brings me to my final principle. Resolving differences through dialogue, not forces. Through the pattern I have described in Ukraine, in Georgia, and in Moldova, Russia has shown the will to use force or the threat of it to coerce its neighbors. And Russia's recent use of nuclear rhetoric, exercises, and operations are deeply troubling. As are concerns regarding its compliance with the International Nuclear Forces Treaty. President Putin's admission that he considered putting Russia's nuclear forces on alert while Russia was annexing Crimea is but one example. Russia has also significantly increased the scale, number, and range of proactive flights by nuclear-capable bombers across, across much of the globe. From Japan to Gibraltar, from Crete to California, and from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Russian officials announced 
plans to base modern nuclear-capable missile systems in Kaliningrad, and they claim that Russia has the right to deploy nuclear forces to Crimea. This will fundamentally change the balance of security in Europe. We learned during the Cold War that when it comes to nuclear weapons, caution, predictability, and transparency are vital. Russia's nuclear saber rattling is unjustified, destabilizing, and dangerous. All of this takes place against the background of Russia's significant rearmament program. Some of its new military systems were put on parade during this year's Victory Day celebration. And Russia is um, deploying many of its most modern systems and basing military units near NATO borders. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, these are not random events. They form a bigger picture which is of great concern. Russia is a global actor that is asserting its military power, stirring up aggressive nationalism, claiming the right to impose its will on its neighbors, and grabbing land. We regret that Russia is taking this course, because when might becomes right, the consequences are grave. For 25 years, we have worked hard to include, not isolate, Russia. Our aim was a strategic partnership. Borders were opened, trade went up, and trust increased. The G7 expanded to become the G8, and Russia was invited into the World Trade Organization. We created the NATO-Russia Council and offered to work together on missile defense. We cooperated in many years, from countering piracy and terrorism to helping Afghanistan. All of this benefited us and it benefited Russia. But today, the choices made by Moscow have taken our relations with Russia to the lowest point in decades. We are not back to the Cold War, but we are far from a strategic partnership. So we need to adapt to deal with the challenges that may be with us for a long time. This adaptation, we are doing it in three ways. Reinforcing our collective defense, reinforcing our deterrence and defense. Managing our relations with a resurgent Russia and supporting our European neighbors. First, strong defense. NATO's core task is collective defense. Our commitment to defend each other, enshrined in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, is as strong and as relevant today as ever before. That is why we are implementing the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. We have increased our presence in the eastern part of Europe, in the air, on land, and at sea. Boosting our air policing and beefing up our exercise programs. We are doubling the size of, NATO, of the NATO response force. Its centerpiece is the spearhead force with lead elements ready to move in as little as 48 hours. Seven European allies 
have, co have volunteered to lead the Spirit Force over the coming years. And we are establishing new NATO command units across the eastern part of our alliance. To make it easier to our forces to exercise, deploy, and reinforce. Yesterday, I thanked President uh, Obama for his leadership and for America's quick and substantial contribution to reinforcing our collective defense. Through the $1 billion European Reassurance Initiative and Operation Atlantic Resolve. Everywhere I go across the lines, I meet US servicemen and women. Their presence sends a clear signal. America stands with Europe, and European allies are in lockstep with the United States. This is transatlantic teamwork. But for all of us, there is more to do before the NATO summit in Warsaw next year and beyond. We are enhancing our cyber defenses and making clear that the cyber attack could trigger a collective response. We are actively developing how we deal with hybrid threats, including by working closely with the European Union. We are speeding up our decision making and we are deepening our intelligence sharing. We are carefully assessing the implications of what Russia is doing, including its nuclear activities. Keeping NATO strong does not come for free. So we must redouble our efforts to meet the defense investment pledge we made last year. To stop the cuts, and gradually increase spending to 2% of GDP and spend better. Because we cannot take our security for granted. And this brings me to my second point. A strong NATO is not only our best protection, but, it's also, but it also provides us with the best foundation to manage our relationship with Russia. We do not seek confrontation with Russia, nor do we seek its isolation. We still aspire to a constructive relationship with Russia, because that would benefit the Euro-Atlantic security and the whole international order. But Russia has changed, and we must adapt. In doing so, we will not change who we are. We are sticking to our principles and to our international commitments. We are committed to preserving European security, institutions, and agreements. We will remain transparent and predictable. We will continue to respond to disinformation with information, not propaganda. And we will keep the channels of communication open with Russia both military to military and diplomatic. Because <clears throat> there is no contradiction in strengthening our collective defense and staying open for dialogue. A vigilant dialogue where actions speak louder than words. And in this dialogue, we will firmly uphold the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all European countries. And this brings me to my third and final point. Supporting our partners in Europe. It is in our interest as a transatlantic community to have neighbors that are stable and independent. That is why NATO is working with Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine to help them to carry out reforms and build strong institutions. These nations are not buffer zones. They are independent, sovereign states. They have the right to choose their own path, and we will continue to help them on that path. Because if our neighbors are more stable, 
we are more secure. Ladies and gentlemen, for decades, as a transatlantic community, we have kept our peoples safe. We have erased divisions in Europe. We built a rules-based order which benefits us all. But as our challenges increase, we must adapt to ensure our security, to protect the values of our open and democratic societies, and to support our partners. This requires continued commitment and solidarity. The world is changing, and we are changing. But one thing that will not change is our determination to stay and stand united. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General Stoltenberg. That was a clear, concise message that is urgently needed. I thank you for that. And good morning, everyone. We're delighted that you could join us. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and Arctic here at the Center. And what a privilege it is to have this, I believe, your first public address as Secretary General here in Washington, I, yeah. I believe. Maybe. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> We're awfully glad uh, you're here. What we thought we'd do for the next 30 minutes or so is yeah. uh, take you up on your kind offer to ask questions, particularly on Russia, but moving to some of the challenges we see to NATO's uh, south. But if I might, uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions. In fact, I think the most challenging part of my job was trying to limit my questions. There's so much we could uh, cover. After we have a few moments here, then we welcome our audience. And I know, I know a CSIS audience, they ask very tough questions. So we look forward to turning to you to engage in, in a conversation. Um, uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, you've been in the job for about six months. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit longer, starting uh, after the NATO uh, yeah. summit in, in Newport. Um, and you, you offered a, a very frank assessment of Russia's military exercises. I'd welcome your frank assessment of NATO's exercising, as we've seen, certainly not the scale. Uh, but could you offer some reflections on, on how NATO has been exercising? We haven't done this type of collective defense in quite a long time. What are your reflections? What are you seeing as you're hearing the reports back from our exercises? Well, every nation has the right to exercise its forces. That goes for uh, NATO, for NATO allies, and of course also for Russia. So my point is not to argue against exercises. If you have forces, you have to exercise them. That's obvious. The challenge is that Russia is conducting the exercises in ways which are undermining transparency and, and predictability, and especially uh, the SNAP exercises. Because as I stated in my speech, they have used these stamp exercises as a disguise for annexing part of another country, uh, annexing Crimea. Uh, and they have used uh, stamp exercises as uh, a way to mass troops uh, on the borders of Ukraine, and also to, 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 to send troops into eastern Ukraine uh, to support the separatists. So they're actually using the stamp exercises as a way uh, to disguise aggressive actions. And, uh, and by doing so, and, uh, and also by having all these exercises without notification, without any, any warning, uh, uh, they are uh, decreasing predictability and increasing uh, uncertainty. And that's exactly the opposite of uh, what uh, uh, the intentions of uh, the uh, Vienna document, the, the Open Skies agreements, and all the other agreements we have, where, which are aiming at creating transparency, predictability, so we avoid misunderstandings, we avoid that, uh, that uh, incidents, accidents, spirals out of control, and that's the reason why we are, from the NATO side, uh, transparent, predictable, 
So you can go on the website of NATO and you can find a list of our next exercises and invite international observers to, to be there just to make sure that they, they are transparent and open. We do more exercises because that's part of our response uh, to the aggressive actions of Russia in Ukraine. Uh, and we will do even more exercises as part of the uh, as a reinforcement of collective defense. But we will do it in a transparent and predictable way to avoid uh, that exercises are creating problems in themselves. Two follow-up questions. Do we, is it best to, get, to return Russia to the, the documents that they've signed, whether that's Open Skies, CFE, or do we need something new? Some have suggested that we need a, a code of conduct immediately to try to get to this notification of exercises. We're increasingly concerned that uh, Russian military aircraft have turned off transponders as they're flying into quite crowded civilian airspace over northern Europe. How do we meet this immediate challenge? Do we need something now as a placeholder, as a code of conduct uh, in the immediate future? Also, an immediate step uh, will be just to implement the agreements we already have. That's uh, what is a, uh, a very straightforward thing to do. Uh, and, to, and to fully uh, respect uh, you know, Vienna documents uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, all the documents we have related to exercises, military activity. Uh, then, uh, of course, we will always be open for looking into how we can develop these kind of agreements and documents. These are not NATO agreements. This is within the framework of the OCE. Uh, uh, but, of course, all al also, allies are taking parts in these agreements in different ways. Uh, and um, and uh, um, we, we have had a special focus on uh, risks connected to increased air activity. Russia has increased its air activity um, by around 50%. That's also one of the reasons why we have increased air policing from the NATO side. We are incept in intercepting many more uh, Russian flights now than just a few years ago. Uh, and uh, the uh, European Aviation Security Agency, I think that's the correct name, uh, at least the European agency, uh, uh, provided a report recently uh, addressing the challenges related to the increased air activity, military air activity, and also the uh, large number of flights of planes without the transponders. And there actually NATO was commended for the way we are doing and conducting our military flights. And, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, stated that uh, military flights without transponders poses a risk to civilian air traffic. So to turn on transponders and to do military flights in due regard to civilian air traffic is also something which can be done immediately. And uh, it will, uh, of course, increase transparency, predictability, and re reduce the risk for uh, international civilian air traffic. Secretary General, you, you painted a very stark picture of Russia's increasingly aggressive posture, the, the question of the nuclear issue. At last September's Newport summit, there was a series of actions that NATO was taken, readiness action plan. You mentioned the uh, uh, very high readiness task force and a variety of other issues. As we look forward to next year's Warsaw summit in July, you mentioned we're in this for the long haul. Do you see that summit as one that just checks the implementation of what happened at Newport, or do you see it moving into the long haul, a long-term strategic posture for NATO. We hosted uh, Polish Defense Minister Szymoniak here last week, and he argued for a Warsaw Initiative for you know, strategic, strategic adaptation, a long-term permanent presence in NATO's east. What are your thoughts as you look towards a year in advance of the next NATO summit? So we are facing uh, a fundamentally changed security environment, and therefore we have to uh, adapt uh, to this fundamentally new environment. And therefore, the adaptation has to also be big and fundamental. And therefore, I very much believe that what we are going to do in Warsaw is to uh, uh, chart a way forward in this adaptation of uh, NATO, uh, both when it comes to military adaptation, uh, uh, political adaptation, and institutional adaptation. And that's partly about increasing our collective defense. We are already doing that. We have to do more. But also, of course, addressing uh, other elements. Uh, uh, for instance, cyber, uh, the importance of intelligence, uh, hybrid warfare, and many other elements where we have to do more. 
uh, and develop uh, new capabilities and adapt. Um, uh, then I will add that in addition to, uh, what should I say, outlining the next phase of adaptation uh, beyond, uh, also after Warsaw, uh, I think it's also important that Warsaw uh, is a summit where we take stock of what we have done from, uh, from Wales to Warsaw. Because implementation is also important. I have been a politician for decades. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to admit, but many politicians make uh, many decisions and adopt many plans, but they're not always uh, in, uh, uh, as good as they should be in implementing the plans. So I think it's extremely important that we also make sure that we are implementing what we have already decided to do uh, about the readiness action plan, about, uh, about uh, the increased uh, preparedness of our forces, and not least about uh, when it comes to defense investment, uh, that we are uh, stopping the cuts in defense investments and starting to increase uh, in, uh, defense uh, investments as we promised in, in, in Wales. Just a, a quick follow-up question on, on the speed of deployability. I think it was uh, Estonian President uh, Ilvis who mentioned that there's a bit of a time gap as Russia puts forward its forces much closer to the Baltic states' borders. The Spearhead Force has a 48-hour deployment. You know, it could be something of a much faster speed, potentially, w using hybrid tactics. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about timing and how fast NATO can deploy in case, worst case scenario, of, that it needed to respond to a border crossing? Well, so preparedness and readiness is key, and that's the reason yeah. why we have increased preparedness and readiness. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, I also welcome what the Baltic countries are doing themselves. Yes. So I'm coming from Norway, and of course, I, we live also in decades, we, 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 have, we felt safe during the Cold War, and, uh, and we feel safe today, because not because we have also NATO troops based in Norway, but because we believe in deterrence. We, we, we believe that NATO troops in the US will be there if needed. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, then, then this is the combination of the, our ability to reinforce, but also, of course, uh, the importance of national forces uh, being the first uh, responders. And, um, and, uh, and I welcome, therefore, that uh, also the Baltic countries, Poland, are now increasing their own investments in defense. Uh, we will establish a persistent uh, presence in the way that we will establish the NATO command units uh, in the six Eastern uh, Allied countries, the three Baltic countries, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria. And that is something new. I think it's important. It's not very really big command and control units, but there will be a NATO presence there. Uh, it will be important for planning, for exercises, but it will also make reinforcement easier. So, uh, and so, national presence, uh, increased preparedness and readiness, uh, also improving our ability to reinforce. But in addition to that, we have what we call the reassurance measures. So we have already increased also NATO presence in the eastern part of the alliance, uh, with more air, air policing, with more uh, troops on the ground and more uh, presence in the Baltic and the Black Sea. So this, it's, it's the whole combination that provides the deterrence, uh, which is uh, so important for NATO. One last question before I turn our audience uh, and open the floor for questions. Another aspect of managing our relations with Russia is about NATO's enlargement agenda. And I can't let you go unless I, I, I ask a question about enlargement. I think it was in uh, 2012, then Secretary Clinton had argued after the Chicago NATO summit that this would be the last summit where enlargement would not be discussed. Well, we've had another summit at Newport. The enlargement question was not tackled. Um, as we head towards Warsaw, uh, I'd love your thoughts on, on the open door. Obviously, not just for Georgia and Ukraine, a very divisive issue within the alliance. But today's uh, Finland's coalition platform suggests that even Finland's keeping its options open for NATO membership, Montenegro. I is there really a path forward uh, in the open door policy for NATO? The open door policy has been a historic success. It's had, it has contributed to stability, to the democracy in Europe, and of course a combination of uh, also the enlargement, the enlargement of NATO and the enlargement of uh, the European Union has really transformed uh, Europe in a very good way. 
Uh, and we, I think it's important to underline the fundamental principle that every nation has uh, uh, its sovereign right to decide its own path, including uh, what kind of security arrangements it wants to be part of. This is enshrined in the uh, many doc documents, including the Helsinki Final Act, and it's something which also Russia has uh, signed to. Uh, and the, the consequence of that is that uh, whether uh, another country is going to become a member of NATO or not is something which is going to be decided by that Aspen country and 28 allies, no one else. No one else has the right to try to veto or to, to, to deny uh, a sovereign country to join uh, uh, an alliance or to, to choose the path uh, it, uh, it wants. We have decided that we'll make decisions uh, on, um, on uh, uh, Montenegro uh, by the end of uh, this year. So uh, this will be a key issue at the foreign ministerial meeting of NATO at the end of 2015. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, also, I'm, 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 I'm reluctant to, to speculate about the Swedes and the Finns. They are neighbors of Norway, and uh, if I say anything about that, I think it will only create, what I say, uh, yeah, it will not contribute in any positive way. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so uh, it's, they have to decide whether they apply, and then we will assess uh, 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 any application from them in the exact way, same way as we assess any other application. Thank you, Secretary General. Okay, you've been warmed up. We're ready to unleash the audience. We have about 15 minutes. If it's okay, we'll, yeah, yeah, it's can okay. we bundle a few questions and yeah. perhaps that, that will be uh, most efficient. If you could please uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. We have microphones passing around. Sometimes you have to speak very directly into those microphones. It can be a little hard to hear. And so why don't we start in the back? I see a question way in the back there. Just wait for that microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg. Uh, my name is Mariam Tarsashvili. I'm a fellow at National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, first of all, I should recall that I had pleasure to meeting you a few years ago in Oslo and Utea while I was a, a, a young activist of you know, social democrats in Georgia. Uh, well, now my question, uh, I applied with this question for the NATO Defense College Fellowship. But I was denied, and I have a hope now that you would help me to um, <laughs> find an answer. Uh, no, to find an answer for this question. Uh, so, well, NATO reshaped its security architecture after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and enlargement helped the um, uh, the organization to maintain its strength. And uh, well, my question is regarding Georgia and upcoming Warsaw summit. Would you think that Georgia would make another step towards membership? I mean, membership action plan, or if not, what would you say would be for Georgia, like what would Georgia benefit from long-term partnership versus membership? Thank you. This would be a good time to ask you for internships, I bet. No, no, no. Uh, uh, to the Eric, uh, Robert, Eric, the, right there. Thank you. Um, Eric Papberg from the McCain Institute. Thank you for your words, Secretary General. I wanted to see if I could push you a little bit on the issue of Sweden and Finland. <laughs> Obviously, we've had a lot of uh, developments taking place since the Wales Summit with enhanced partnership and the MOU on host nation support. How do you see this relationship going forward um, as a partnership? Um, and in terms of the membership, we've heard new signals from the Finnish government about keeping the options open. Just want to see if I could get your take on how useful would it be from a NATO perspective to have Sweden and Finland be a member? Would that really help NATO uh, defend the Baltics and reassure them? And would it even be provocative to Russia? Thank you. Take one more, the ambassador right here, please. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio Bisognero, the Italian ambassador and the former deputy secretary general of NATO until three years uh, ago. Uh, Italy is very proud of being uh, providing air policing to the Baltic states as we speak. We are one of those seven nations that will be one of the lead nations for the rapid reaction force and we are actively contributing to the Estonian cyber center in, in, in Estonia. At the same time, you did mention the complex challenges emanating from the south. I would be interested in you elaborating from, on that and also what the NATO role could be uh, in those challenges. Thank you. We took 
took you up on the, your kind offer of asking you some questions on the South. So Georgia, right. Sweden, Finland, and the complexities of the South. Yeah. The first, uh, uh, about Georgia, so first of all, it's good to see you again after I saw you at Utøya. Uh, then, uh, um, uh, to be Secretary General of NATO gives me a lot of uh, say power and mandates, but I don't have the mandate to grant any scholarships for the NATO. <laughs> uh, that's a ball my pay grade. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, good luck. Uh, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then on, the, on enlargement, also, well, what we have is that we have uh, a very close partnership with Georgia. We, we, uh, we, have, uh, we are in the process of implementing the substantial package, which is uh, expanding further uh, the cooperation and the partnership with Georgia. Uh, we are establishing a training center, and uh, we are really doing very uh, substantial uh, activity together with Georgia, and I think that's important. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, and we also do defense capacity building in, uh, in Georgia, uh, which increases uh, Georgia's uh, ability to uh, defend itself. And uh, I think that's important for Georgia and to the stability in the uh, region. Uh, so when it, but when it comes to membership, uh, I think I have nothing more to say uh, than what has been stated again and again. And, uh, and uh, I was at the summit in, uh, in, um, in Bucharest in 2008, where we made the decisions related to Georgia. Those decisions are restated uh, at, as late as our, at our summit in, in, in Wales uh, last year. Uh, but what we decided also in Wales was that uh, uh, the first applicant or Aspen country we are going to address is Montenegro. And as I said, we're going to address Montenegro later this year. Then on Sweden, yeah, but, but anyway, as I appreciate the very close uh, cooperation we have with Georgia, and Georgia is also contributing a lot to many different NATO operations. So we already have a very important partnership which we have to, I should say, uh, to develop, and which is of importance. Uh, then on Sweden and Finland, you said that you would try to push me a bit further. You will not succeed. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, can, I can talk for some minutes, but I will not say anything more of substance about that. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's and that's and but, but that are, I mean, uh, it's easy to joke about this, but you know I think it's I think it's so important that it 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 has to be a Swedish and or a Finnish uh, decision. I think that everything I say about you know the advantages and the disadvantages and uh, and how different things can affect uh, the debates within Sweden and Finland can only be misused and misunderstood. So if I was a journalist, or if I was such as a scientist, or if I was anything else than the Secretary General NATO, I could say a lot. But because I'm the Secretary General NATO, I can say very little. And then add to that, I'm a Norwegian. Uh, and then so that's the reason why I'm saying so little. Yeah, uh, but I think the, uh, uh, so there is a debate now uh, in Sweden and Finland, and we just have to follow that. And it's a democratic decision of them in democratic uh, nations, countries to decide whether they, were, they would like to apply. And then, of course, we will uh, assess the application in the same way as we assess any other applications. But let me add, and you also alluded to that, we, we have a partnership with Sweden and Finland. And we are developing that. <coughs> and they are enhanced opportunity partners. And we are really doing more and more together with them. And actually, now there is a, uh, we're, we're exercising together with the Swedes and, and the Finns. Yeah. We, are, we are sharing information. And we are working more and more closely together with them. And at the, uh, at the foreign ministerial meeting of NATO uh, in Antalya uh, a few weeks ago, we decided to, to go further in developing our uh, partnership with, with Sweden and Finland. So they are really close partners. We do a lot of work together with them, and I welcome that. The South. The South, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, to the East, we see challenges, threats related to a state. And we respond in a way which is in a way familiar, familiar to what we have done before, collective defense and so on. To the south, <coughs> we me. uh, meet and we are faced with non-state <coughs> threats and challenges. And that's a much more mixed and complicated picture. Uh, we see violence, turmoil in uh, in uh, Iraq, Syria, in North Africa. Uh, we see people trying to 
across the Mediterranean. <laughs> Uh, and we also see terrorist uh, attacks uh, taking place in our streets, inspired by uh, some of the uh, ISIL and other terrorist organizations in the South. I welcome that all NATO allies contribute to the coalition, uh, the US-led coalition fighting ISIL. Uh, and I think we have to understand that one of the reasons why NATO allies and NATO partners can contribute to this coalition is that they have developed interoperability. They have learned how to work together uh, through the cooperation in NATO and through, for instance, working together in Afghanistan and other uh, NATO missions. So even though this is not a NATO operation, NATO-led operation, I think a lot of NATO experience, NATO knowledge, NATO interoperability is very useful for the uh, coalition fighting ISIL. Um, then, in addition, uh, NATO is, uh, we decided in Wales last year to develop uh, defense capacity building as a new important tool. And I think the defense capacity building is key for the South. Because I believe very much the, on the, in the idea that we should try to project stability uh, by building local forces, uh, local uh, institutions, so they can take more responsibility for their own security, uh, and, uh, and thereby we can project stability without always deploying large number of NATO forces. And uh, we are doing that in Jordan. We have boosted substantially our cooperation with Jordan, doing defense capacity building in Jordan. We are now in the process of uh, assessing uh, a request from the government of Iraq to do help them with build the institution, reform, increase their ability to uh, so create stability. Uh, we stand ready to do that in Libya when the situation on the ground allows. And actually, even if we don't call it defense capacity building, what we are doing in Afghanistan now is defense capacity building. We are helping the Afghans building their capacity to take full responsibility also in the future for their own security. And uh, I think that to develop also the ability of countries in the region to take more responsibility for their own security is important for the countries in the region, but also for uh, NATO, and we have to do more of that. Fantastic. I think we'll take a lightning round of the next three questions. We have, uh, so we'll go to this side, the one in the back right there, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, Vadim Allen, Voice of American News. Um, I would like to ask, um, we here in the uh, United States, uh, we, see, we hear more voices now in the media and on the internet uh, that uh, crisis in Ukraine and uh, standoff with Russia is uh, mostly a European problem. Hmm. And uh, uh, what would you say to those people who say that it should be uh, European countries putting most efforts into resolving the crisis and it should be Germany or France uh, leading the way? Thank you. Thank you. Can we take one more? I see one in the back, in the corner, please. So, good morning. Um, my name is Paul Tennant. I'm a British exchange officer here in DC. Um, there was a fascinating exercise here last year in CSIS which considered a Russia scenario. And one of the most interesting things was an interaction with the audience in which uh, there was almost no agreement on what constituted a breach of Article 5. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the challenge of defining the threshold at which Article 5 is breached, particularly in a domain like cyber, um, and also maybe speak slightly to uh, dealing with an adversary who determinedly stays below that threshold. Fantastic question. I think with time I'm going to have you respond to those two questions. Mm. First about Ukraine. The, the Ukraine is in Europe, uh, but uh, of course it's, it's a problem or a crisis uh, which affects not only European countries. Because when international law is violated, it undermines uh, the whole idea of a world order which is based on rules. So of course it's important for the global order uh, when, uh, when uh, 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 international law is violated in the way we have seen in uh, Ukraine and uh, when it comes to the annexation of the illegal uh, annexation of uh, Crimea. Um, so Europeans are in lead when it comes to 
trying to find a solution uh, because France and uh, Germany in particular, but also all the European countries, are really, really in lead. But of course, it's, it's, it's great to also have the United States uh, taking part in the efforts, and the United States is doing that. Canada is uh, providing support for uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole NATO alliance is uh, providing both strong political and practical support to Ukraine. In addition, uh, several NATO allies uh, provide for instance, training and uh, direct support to Ukraine. So I think this is a European challenge, but it's also a global challenge. And it's a challenge which NATO as an alliance, a transatlantic alliance, is uh, addressing. Um, uh, then when it comes to Article 5, the important thing is that NATO stands ready to protect and defend all allies against any threat. And uh, uh, when it comes to, for instance, cyber, I think the important thing we did uh, as a, as a last year was to decide that also a cyber attack can trigger uh, Article 5, collective defense, because we regard cyber as potentially as dangerous as a conventional attack. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore, we are developing our capabilities to respond. Uh, partly to detect who is behind. Our main responsibility is to, uh, is to defend our uh, own NATO networks. Uh, we are developing teams, capabilities, we are doing more exercises. We, I recently visited a cyber defense exercise. Uh, so we are increasing our readiness to do uh, cyber defense. But we are also assisting and helping allies in developing their own capabilities to uh, do cyber uh, defense. And, and as always, uh, every situation, every attack uh, will also is, is unique. But I think we all can just trust and rely that NATO will respond in a proportionate uh, way, uh, if and when needed, whatever uh, kind of attack we are uh, also, uh, which are launched against us. I think the one thing we learned mm. from that, uh, that particular simulation that we did here was that political leaders need to exercise how they make those decisions when they are below threshold levels. It actually has to be practiced and understood because attribution will never be perfect. Mm. And when political will is perhaps not there, it's really leaders sitting around the table exploring, well, what would that mean? What would we need? what is the intelligence required? And I think that is one area where we see NATO's political leadership could gain some value in practicing how that decision-making process works. And so first of all, I very much believe in exercises. Second, I believe in the importance of exercising also political uh, leaders. Yeah. Third, I think we have to trust political leaders because we have elected them. Uh, uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, related to that, I think, is that we, we have never in NATO said that if X happens, then Y will be our response. So at some stage, you have to prepare your strategies, your planning, you have to exercise, you have to imagine different scenarios. But at the end, it will be a decision taken by political leaders how to respond. Therefore, we need the capabilities. We need the capacity to, to respond. We need to exercise. I mean, you have to understand that cyber is also a real threat. But to have a, we, we, cannot, we can never have a specific list exactly how we are going to respond to every possible and impossible uh, threat, uh, because it's the, the world and the future is too complex. So as long as we have the capacities, the capabilities, and, the, and we have exercised it, then we have to trust that our political leaders are able to take the right decisions, even when we have lost elections. Well, and that is a very positive note to end on. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, thank you so much for your clarity uh, of message, and we look forward to watching uh, how NATO evolves in the next year on the road to our next summit in Warsaw in July of next year. Please join me in thanking, thanking Secretary General Stoltenberg. Thank you.